Amen. I pray that you will learn to be good negotiators. Don't worry, I'll give you a break soon. Esther, chapter 4, verse 1. We know the popular story of Esther. This is a long one. I think we will not finish. We know the popular story of Esther and how through Mordecai's instructions, she became the queen of Persia. The Bible says Persia stretched from India to Ethiopia. It was a very long and wide expanse. She was married to a powerful man. And when she came into the palace, she had become a queen, so now she didn't know what was happening to the Jews. So when the Jews received the, king, the king's edict that all Jews should be slaughtered, Esther did not even know what was going on. She was not thinking about their welfare. She thought that things were business as usual and she was okay. So when she saw her uncle come to the gate, he has taken off his clothes in sackcloth and ashes, crying. She had to send to ask him, what, what is wrong? What is it? Because she doesn't know, even though she has an uncle, she doesn't know what is happening with the people whom she left. Mordecai sends for her and says, look, Esther, you have to do something about it. You know? So let's read um, verse 1. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate and none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And every province whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes and Esther knew nothing about this. So Esther's mates and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hattak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hattak went forth to Mordecai into the street of the city which was before, and Mordecai told him, of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given as Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make request before him for her people. So Hatta came and told Esther all that, and then... Esther says, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king, into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king may hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 years. And they told to Mordecai <laughs> Esther's words. Now, the first thing I want you to note about the negotiation skills of Esther is that she found out the facts. She found out the facts before she acted. And many of us, we don't sometimes know what we are dealing with. And we just start to solve issues, solve problems, or go about them in a way we think they should be solved. But Esther sent her chambermaid, say, we're and asked Mordecai what it's about. And Mordecai, uh, the, the chambermaids came to tell her. Then she sent Hatak, who was more of an official, and who would bring more details. And Hatak came and said, that, look, the Jews have received a letter. This is what Mordecai is saying. And they are going to be wiped out because of Haman's decree. So she found out the facts of what was really on the ground. What is going on? And then, she was also very knowledgeable about the laws of where she was. Because she said that anybody, whether male or female, that comes in unto the king without being called, that person will surely be put to death. Whether you are male, female, whoever you are. 
The only proviso to that law, which you don't understand, the only uh, exception, is that the king will stretch out his scepter to you. So Esther knew palace protocol and understood exactly what was required of her in terms of behavior. And she sent that message to Mordecai. Then Mordecai says, well, there may be all this protocol and thing, but think not that you will escape when all of us are being slaughtered, the way you have dissociated yourself. Don't think you will escape. But if you won't help God's people, deliverance will arise from somewhere else. Like I was saying last night, you know, it's just a privilege that God will use you. And it's just a privilege that God will use you to save his people. But if you don't avail yourself, he will look for another. Not because he wants to, but he doesn't work without our will. So when we are in the church, you don't want to do anything. Anything small you are asked to do is a problem. We have to beg you. We have to praise you. Sister, you are great. Sister, we really appreciate you. What you did last year, daughter, you can make it. We have to praise you up to today. Before you rise up. If we are saying the vote of thanks and we leave your name out, we are going to have a problem. And they don't appreciate me. And they don't think what if, if we were looking for appreciation, some of us would have resigned by now. Do you understand? But it's understanding that God is the rewarder. And you are privileged to have a small vegetable patch in his vineyard that you can cultivate. Because even in your workplace, they say that they don't want you. But in God's vineyard, he uses all of us. He just wants willing vessels. Because he makes us what he wants us to become. Amen. And then also, Esther went about whatever she was going to do with spiritual warfare. She said, go and fast for me. My maidens and I will also fast. And then I'll go in unto the king. She, she used spiritual means to break through. Now, some of you married people, you never pray about what to do. How to go about a problem. How to seek your husband's face about something. It doesn't occur to you. You just do what you saw your mother do. And that is, sometimes you say, okay, then I will not bless you in the bedroom. Sometimes you say, okay, then I will not make nice food for you. You won't eat today. <laughs> and all the things I'm saying, I've seen as a pastor. I've been to people's houses. They said they were in women with direction. And I had great faith. I said, oh, that's what this woman, she has direction, even in her marriage and all. When I went, the husband said, there's a crisis here. I said, really? My wife has not been making any meals in the house. So I asked the sister, why? Lady Reverend, he promised to change our cooker. And he has not done it. So before he does it, he will eat cereal all his life till Jesus comes. <laughs> the husband went to bring the pack of cereal to show him. He said, look, this, this is what I live on. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, that's it. There's not, I said, oh, I was very ashamed. Said, A woman with direction <laughs> has not brought direction <laughs> to the home. So you solve your problem in your own way. But Esther said, go and fast and pray for me these three days. My maidens and I will also fast and pray. And then I'll go in unto the king. She did not live with presumption. Some of us would have said, oh, I'm Mrs. Atazexis. Even your name alone is powerful. Oh, I'll just go in and talk to him. Of course, there's protocol, but I'm above that. There's protocol. But even in marriage, there's protocol. You can't just misbehave anyhow and expect the man to remain the same like Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. It's true. Some women really misbehave. The brothers are clapping at the back. Amen, brothers. You don't respect him. You speak to him anyhow. You know, sometimes you even embarrass him in public. And then you expect him to be a husband to you. Of course, he should love you like Christ loved the church. But even Christ, at a point, he took a whip and beat the people in the temple. I have seen people totally misbehave. You know, and sometimes they've come for counseling. The two of them are sitting with me. And I say, the husband will say, oh, but I always help her in this way. In your dreams. In your dreams. You say, you help who? In your dreams. I say, all that you are saying may be true. 
And you may be very emotional, but it's not getting us anyway. Do you see? In your dreams. Was I asleep? Was I asleep? <laughs> when I saw this lady behaving like that, I said, hey, because she does not behave like that when the male pastors are there. So as I was looking, I wanted to video it. Do you know? But Esther was confronted with this, but she said, go and fast for me. I also and my maids, we shall fast. And we'll see what the Lord is. Do you treat your problems from a spiritual perspective? It goes back to yesterday's message. Carnality, galop. It does not occur to you to pray about anything. But the Bible says, pray about everything. It says that. Have no anxiety, but in everything by prayer. Another verse says, pray about everything. But you, you don't pray about everything because everything is macho. Everything is your might. Everything is your wisdom. Everything is what you can do. But Esther was queen, but she said, go and pray for me. Because this one, I need a higher wisdom. And I need a higher favor. Amen. I know of a pastor's wife whom I knew years ago. I was a young up-and-coming sister. But in the church, she would hold the pastor's shirt like this. All his buttons would come off. Hey. And then she will pack all his things in a suitcase and everything and come to church with it that tonight after the service. Don't come home. Everybody knew. It was terrible. And the pastor was always under a lot of pressure. And that's, sometimes Bishop knows all these things. That's why when he's preaching sometimes, you people feel the stories are out of this world, you know. He says, sister, you look so meek and mild, but you are so some way. He knows what he's doing. This pastor was always under constant pressure. Nice, great man of God. One day he went to preach and he just didn't come back. He was just kneeling down. He died. I see the wife every time because now she comes around. Oh, since Rev died. Oh, since Rev died. But when Rev was alive, it is even believed that you drove Rev to his grave. The way. And now she needs help with her child. She needs help with school fees. She needs help with this. Since it's finished. But when her husband was alive, when I met her, she told me that she has just come from uh, 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 some powerful international Bible school. And her husband is in the ministry, but God has called her to another ministry. I said, ah. I said what verse is that? She said, oh, that's what the Lord is saying. I said, so what are you going to? She said, I'm changing geographical areas. I'm going to another city. And the Lord is going to use me there. Is it the Lord? So she moved. And when I told her, she said, oh, don't worry. She thinks it's easy. She should go. Cry. Within two weeks, she had come back. She said, hey, <laughs> ministry mom. <laughs> no, no, it's not an easy thing. <laughs> but total misbehavior. But Esther knew that was protocol in the palace. And the fact that you are the king's wife does not mean you can break every law, break every rule, and just misbehave. When I go for staff meetings in church, I know that my husband is the head. And for that time, I am a member of staff. So I can't just get up and, hey, you, move there, you, sit here, you. Hey, I'm an employee. I'm a sheep. I'm an under pastor. I serve under somebody. There's protocol in the house. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Even when they ask me to... Sister, ma'am, Mrs. Dudley, what are your views? I will say my views by the grace of God, but with a certain respect. Wow. You know, when I meet Bishop Saki and Bishop Patti, it's true, they are my friends from university, but when we are in a meeting and we are all deciding, so there's a certain decorum that should prevail. Wow. I mean, by you, because you are at Texas, we have not heard your name before. <laughs> so you should just get up and misbehave. And some of you, it may not be a staff, but some of you, thank God you're not married to pastors. Because the way you are, even when they are preaching, you walk out of there, you can't receive. Because he said, the way he misbehaves Saturday night, what is he saying? Love, love you, your neighbor, indeed. <laughs> it takes the grace of God to sit on a seat and receive somebody who may have hurt you just before church. But as soon as he steps on that pulpit, he's a man of God, is the unction and the office. Protocol must prevail even in marriage. Yeah. The fact the Bible says, Oh, and they were naked, the man and the woman, and they were not ashamed. There's still there should be some shamefacedness. 
Some of you, when your husband is calling, your, your child comes. Mommy, daddy's going, oh, he too. We are all tempted sometimes because they can send the men. <laughs> but there's a certain protocol that will also feed into your children. The way you respect your husband will also let them respect their father or their mother in the same way. So Esther said, go and pray for me. I can't just budge in. I can't just walk in. There's a certain protocol and decorum that must be observed because he's the king. And that is what pertains in the palace. And it was in place before I came. And I believe she remembered Vashti also. We must learn from the examples you see and not think that you, you are the latest thing that has happened in space and we haven't seen some of you before. And that me, the king really loves me, but so it's different. It's not different. One thing I keep saying in Esther chapter 4 is that Esther was beautiful. She was chosen above all. Her wedding was a public holiday. You have you, your wedding, has it been a public holiday before? <laughs> the king gave gifts to everybody. You, your wedding, you are rather expecting gifts. Not that you are giving to everybody. And he called it the day of Esther which is celebrated up to today by the Jews. When, when the, she freed the Jews, it's now become like the Feast of Esther. But her wedding was also a day of Esther, a public holiday, and gifts were given and all that. But the Bible says when Mordecai went to ask Esther, Esther said that these 30 days, the king has not called me. So it's not your beauty that keeps your husband or makes your marriage work. And God has not created any man to meet all your needs. So if you don't see him for 30 days, what will you do? You have a God. But what most women do is they make the men in their lives their God. When he's not there, you cry, oh, James, where are you? Before he was not there. And when he was not there before, Jimmy, how are you living? God brings husbands, brings spouses, all that, as a blessing. But it is not supposed to take the place of God. But we do, without thinking, put those people these ones, in the place of God. <laughs> and we make demands on men that only God can fulfill. Why don't you tell me that I'm beautiful? Why don't you tell me that you appreciate me? Why don't you say nice things to me? All that is true. But look, no man can meet your needs 100%. Only Jehovah God. Yeah. Only Jehovah. And that will free you to be happy. And not to be a complainer. Every day you are complaining about something. I said, but Lady Reverend, it's true. It's true. It will remain like that. Go and read the Bible. Say, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Why are you making that straight which the Lord has made crooked? My husband said he has not seen anything God has made that straight. The shoreline, trees, mountains, nothing is straight. But man comes and puts a ruler like this. <laughs> Amen. And that is why relationships fail. Because our expectations are not realistic. Amen. Sometimes when my husband is going on these crusades, Ede, here, here, now he's going out of Ghana to Nigeria, all these dangerous places, going here, going there. There are times when I'm tempted to tell him, oh, you've been going for a while. Just stay with me. But he also has to go. And the good thing is that I can see that he's trying to have a balance. Because sometimes you say, after this meeting, it's very hectic. Let's go to Takradi and be happy. Right. But some of you say, Takradi, I want to go to New York, not Takradi. Why? You just want to rest. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I need somebody to talk to in the night or to ask him his decision. I call. The mobile number you have dialed is out of coverage area. What do you do? You say, eh. Every day this meeting, then the phone is off. I Me, mean, I can't stand such things. Why does it go to such hinterlands where you cannot reach it? What a... No. When I hang up, Jehovah reminds me that he is there. Wow. Hallelujah. When I hang up, I look in the church, I see that God has raised many lives to be a blessing to me. There are people that I can talk to. God does not create one man to meet all your needs. We are here oh, to help each other and to meet each other's needs. Yeah. Hallelujah. Your husband may forget to tell you that you look nice. But your friend will see you at just, Hey, sister, today you didn't take it easy at all. Be happy. And don't say, eh, he should have said it. Why? Too many expectations on a man. 
He will love you, but he cannot be God to you. It's only God who is the all-sufficient God. Jehovah El Shaddai. He's more than enough. There's no woman, no man who is more than enough. Sometimes even the person means well, I always say it, but the person has limitations. So, oh, I'll be there by this. Yesterday when we were going with Reverend Mills, and we got to a place, a car is burning. There's traffic and all that. We mean to be there by this, but we are limited by traffic, police, firefighters. What will you do? Man has too many limitations for you to put your whole life. You are the love of my, we are thinking about Jesus, you are thinking about Jimmy. The words don't mean the same things. And then when you marry, you are always unhappy. So I thought marriage will bring this. I thought marriage will bring that. Oh, I'm not happy. Oh, well, then you feel that the fault is the other party. But the fault is you and your expectations and your unrealistic demands. So every day he should send you flowers. Look, where is that from? Every day. You will not remember every day. He's a high-flying banker going here, going there. He cannot always remember to send you flowers. Today, he forgot your birthday. It's true. He shouldn't forget. But don't let Second World War come down because of that. Amen. My husband has almost always remembered my birthdays. But some years ago, one day, he didn't remember my birthday. And I was looking at him. I said, hey, morning, afternoon. The day was going. So I went to buy a card, and I wrote in it, happy birthday to me. <laughs> and I gave it to him. He went and said, ah, sister, you are some way, pa. How? Oh. He called me some like, oh, T, you know what has happened to me here? They have bought a card, and they have written inside, happy birthday to me. It's some way, pa. Oh, sister, let's go for dinner. Oh, so you too, why? You know, that solved the problem. And since then, there's been no <laughs> lack of remembrance. <laughs> I have not been called in unto the king these 30 days. Sometimes you are even speaking to your husband. It's not that he doesn't want to understand. I see it even in my sons. They feel that, ah, what are you saying? You see, when they go out and they cast, how was the program? Good. Good. And they are just looking for something to eat. Who came? People. <laughs> what did they do? Oh, a whole lot of stuff. So did you see Lady Pastor Barbara? I think so. <laughs> did you see Lady Pastor BM? Oh, okay. So the dancers, did their dress work? Oh, mommy, please. I can't even remember what they wore. Please. <laughs> but if I go and ask my girlfriend, she will remember. Did their dress work? Oh, hey. It worked. You see that combination with the... Oh, when they turned like it was very powerful. And, why are you telling a rock to give birth? <laughs> So you can be happy. You can get certain information from certain people. But from other people, men don't give details. So I've learned to ask question by question and spaced. Do you understand? Because when it's together, it's like, it's pressure. My husband says, when they are talking, even if you don't understand, say yes. Wow, really? <laughs> I have not been called these 30 days. Amen. God has not provided any one man or one person to meet all your needs. So don't think that even married people have it all. They don't. They don't. Esther said, all the king's servants, the peoples of the king's prophecies, whether man or woman, you can't come in. She knew the limitations. I have not been called these 30 days. Do warfare and use spiritual weapons. Draw strength and courage from the prayer back in you. Use prayer to move the hand of heaven and deal with spiritual opposition. And then use your natural skills that God has given you. Amen. So after Esther had done all this, do this, do this, do this. Verse 5. Esther chapter 5, verse 1. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house 
over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. Esther didn't just go. She put on a royal apparel. There are certain things that must be done before you come into the presence of a king. You don't just come in your nighty or your house coat, although he's your husband. At this time, he was sitting as king. And therefore, you must use the natural skills you have. She was beautiful, but she enhanced her beauty by putting on her royal apparel. Because she knew the secret that men are moved by sight, although they say we walk by sight, but... They are the most sight sightseeing people you've ever met. That is why a man can be driving. He has seen a woman he doesn't know. Whether she's a witch or a Jezebel, he can desire her. Women are more relationship oriented. We tend to have to know the person. He has to love us. And even we need to hear his voice. Oh, Lady Reverend, when I hear his voice, I was melting. <laughs> but a man can pass by a picture. He doesn't know the woman. But he can still desire her. Because they walk by sight. <laughs> and that is why I believe that God made it that way. So that you'll be attracted to us. Because other, that is why in Ghana, you know, Sometimes some men are driving and they see you by the wayside. They can just make a ditch. They've seen you. They don't know you. But just sight, you know, can make them not think properly. So Esther put on her royal apparel. Because how you look really affects men. Now some of us in the house, like my husband says, we have become Bob Mali or whatever we are. <laughs> Captain Haddock, you tie with that uh, hairpiece. And the only time they see your beautiful hair is when you are stepping out to go out. The only time you wear any nice dress is when you are stepping out to go out to your work, your boss. And for other people, but not for the man in your life. There is something wrong. <laughs> Once I met a lady. The husband said, Lady Reverend, since I married my wife, and she had a, a, a baby. She has a thick linen uh, 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 90 that she made for herself. Lady Reverend, that 90 has been the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> so I asked the wife, is it true? Oh, Lady Reverend, it's very true. I said, but you two wives, I have not thought about it. <laughs> so men live by sight. Learn to look good at home. Yeah. Not only when you are coming out. Learn to enhance your beauty. <laughs> Even when you are at home. Do you see? Take time to look nice. Not only when you are going out. Because that is for the outsiders. But the one who loved you and honored you. And put this on your finger. You don't. Sometimes in my office, some of my ladies will come. Volunteers, staff. They'll be walking around. Are you busy? Huffing and puffing. I say, ah. But this hairstyle, is that what you are coming out of your house with? So, oh, yes. Said, ah. But even your pony is so dry. There's no life in the pony. What is that? Ah. Oh, is that my hair? And then, and then sometimes the pony, all oh, this place, it has come out. I said, what are these impossibles? They are not going in. <laughs> Have you arrived here in the name of ministry calling, whatever? You, you, you can't do your hair too. Please try and do your hair. Because even me at the office, I don't find it nice. How much more at home? Do you understand? So sometimes you take the men in your lives for granted. And you look anyhow. You will never work out. You will never do anything. You are just like you are. When he married you, you were not this size. Oh. But you have just left yourself completely. And you think that he's a Christian man, so he should be happy. But Bible says, 
Temptations are sure to come, but woe to them by whom? By whom? So don't be the by whom. They come. She put on her royal apparel. Amen. When Joseph was called, the Bible says in Genesis 41, verse 41, I believe that he went and he shaved and he put on a new apparel and he went into the presence of a king. Although he was gifted, he was going to interpret, he didn't know what he was going to do, but he knew that he was appearing in the presence of a king. So he took time and hastily put on something good before he went. Because Egyptians did not like beards. That's why he shaved before he went. So those are part of the negotiation skills. Your body language, your presentation. David said, I, I received your words and then now I'm receiving your person. Your person is part of the reception. My pastor told me years ago in Takradi that you will never get a second chance to make a first impression. And some of you, the reason why you don't get the jobs, those interviews, is the way you arrive. There's some rucksack behind your back, your gate and everything, there's something wrong. And you just arrive and they ask you, can, you, can, you, can we get you something to drink? Say, oh, yes. First of all, tea, after that juice, after that some scones. I mean, try and have a little deck. Say, oh, water will be okay. So that you don't take them. To one interview you are coming for, we should make tea. After that, we should give you apple juice and scones. I mean, it's true you came with your hunger, but a little decorum will do. Sometimes the reason why you are not getting that job is your whole demeanor and your whole, the way you have come. The Bible says man looks at the outward and God looks on the inside. So the outward affects man. Mm -hmm. So work on the outward as well. She stood in the inner court of the king's house. She didn't just walk in. So she objected herself to palace protocol. Subject yourself to protocols in the marriage, in the office, in church. Don't just walk in. So it's my church. Oh, it's my pastor. Oh, it's a, there's a certain decorum that should come with it. She stood in the inner court. But she stood in a place where she would catch the king's attention. Amen. She studied where the king was sitting. You see, the Bible says that the king sat over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. And it was so, when the king saw Esther the king, the queen, standing in the court, when she went in, she went at a time where the king was sitting in a particular place. And from that angle, he could see her in the inner court. Strategy. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. She stood in the inner court. She didn't just go. Some of you, you won't go, but you'll be shouting. Attack there. Attack there. <laughs> I'm standing here. Yeah, it's me. Your voice will go. It's not every time you have to be shouting and talking. But she just put on her royal apparel. Who spoke vol which spoke volumes? And she just stood in the inner court where you can see me, but I'm not saying anything. You see, the Bible says even to women that our adorning should not just be wearing of apparel, gold, doing of it, but with shamefacedness and sobriety. So some of us are too, you know, if you listen to, is it how to be found? How to be found? I say that when Rebecca got off the camel, she asked, who is that man? They said, oh, that's Isaac, the one you are being brought to to marry. The Bible says she covered her face with a veil. For some of you, you would have descended the camel immediately. Isaac, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Isaac, 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 no. I mean, have a little Holy Ghost class. It's true that you like him and you've come and all that, but have a little, let him feel that he fought for what he has. But some of us, we are chasing the men. They don't like you. You're, hey. And you're always calling him. Why is the one I call you? Don't respond. Why is he that? Because he doesn't like you. Get the message. So I believe that even for a woman, when it's working, you know, you just. You know, when I met my husband, he used to speak a lot of parables. He'll say that, hmm. So, if somebody asked you the million dollar question. 
What will you say? I said, hey, what's a million dollar question? So, if somebody said that, I mean, you should marry him, like in the future, what would you say? I said in my head, huh? You think I was born yesterday? <laughs> so when he would ask me that, I would say, hmm, I wonder. I said, hey, you wonder? I said, yes, I wonder. I should come and give you an answer that, oh, hey, brother, if it's you, then mm, what is that? <laughs> so I said, I wonder. Then you'll find another way of framing, you know. So as you are going, do you think that whatever, do you have plans in the future? Da, da, da? Long talk. Then I'll say, I wish I knew. I had about three answers. Because I tell sisters, don't hear till you hear. Because many brothers, they lead sisters on. And when they finish, they say, I didn't propose to a lady reverend. I didn't say anything. But you were calling her every day. You took her to meet your parents. You did so many things. Now you say, you didn't say anything to her. A sister was telling me, he came to see my parents. He called me every day that I was out of the country. He always sent me mail. We spoke like whatever. But later the brother said that, but we have never been in a relationship. She was just my friend. I was just being nice. So don't hear wedding bells when you shouldn't hear. Sisters, amen. <laughs> Guard your heart with all diligence. So she just stood in the inner court. And from where the king was sitting, he could see her. So he stretched out the royal scepter to her. And she drew near. And she touched the top of the scepter. She went through all the necessary protocols to show respect. The basic thing every man wants is just respect. Basic. And that you don't buy in a shop. You just give it. He just wants respect. So she drew near. And she didn't just come because, oh, the king has stretched the scepter, so let me go beyond the scepter. No. And then she touched the scepter. Even that warms the person's heart towards you. When you come into the presence of God, there's some protocol to be observed. Yeah. Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving yeah. and into his courts with praise. Do you know what has baffled me? One of the things over the years about the Lord's Prayer, the fact that if I were to make the prayer, the first sentence will be, forgive us our trespasses. Because I'm always thinking about our sins and what we've done. But he just says, our Father in heaven, your relationship to him is greater to him than the mistakes that you will make. Yeah. So the first sentence he taught us is, you know, everything is based on my relationship with you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Come into his courts with thanksgiving. It doesn't matter what your problem is. His gates with and his courts with praise. There's something to praise him for. There's something to thank him for. Before you come with your list of needs from here to there, observe palace protocol. Amen. 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 And praise opens the door to you. So Esther, she touched the golden scepter. And then the king said unto her, verse 3, What will thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given thee to the half of the kingdom. Remember, she has not spoken. Your attitude, your behavior, the way you comport yourself brings you the answer before you make your request. Body language speaks a lot. Sometimes you send your child. The child will not say that he or she won't go, but it's a message. And so is your attitude and your face. It's also a message. So she just touched the golden scepter, drew near, and then the king said, what would thou have me do for you, Queen Esther? When you respect, the respect comes back to you. What do you have to do, Esther? What do you have to do, my wife? What do you have to do, Queen Esther? He's now also using your official title. Why? Because you first of all sowed that seed that is coming to you. Amen. Amen. And you don't also have to speak because divine favor is working on your behalf. You prayed before you came. You waited on God. And you are just depending on his grace. 
So as you came to stand there, the favor of God just comes to you. You know, sometimes when I'm driving in traffic, I was telling my staff that one thing that describes the favor of God to me, some people, I don't feel like giving the right of way to. I mean, if I have the right of way, sometimes, but some people, I just sit and I stop. Oh, cross. Oh, what is it? It's favor. I don't know them. They haven't done anything for me, but somehow you just choose them. But this is the person I want to be kind to. And I believe that is the same with God. And God can make you favorable. Just favorable. Amen. The king says, I will give you half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, if it seemed good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Amen. Hmm. The king said, I'll give you half the kingdom. Many of us would have forgotten why we came. <laughs> oh, if he gives me the kingdom, I can employ more people to fight. We can win this battle. That may be a better strategy than saving these Jews. And also, if I save these Jews, of what benefit is it to me? But half the kingdom is a very powerful place. I'll become very, very, very powerful and I can influence whatever. No. But Esther was not there because of her own desire. Because when Mordecai said, go in, she came to that point where she said, if I perish, I perish. She had given up everything to obey God and to help God's kingdom. And so when the king said, I'll give you half the kingdom, she doesn't even address it. She just says, if it please the king. If it please the king. Most of us, we don't even know how to speak. Even on the phone. Sometimes people are so rude. Yes? And I say, oh, is that how you respond? Oh, <laughs> Reverend, I didn't know it was you. You don't have to know that it's me. You don't have to. But in the church, I have some people who call me all the time. And they are my friends, right? So sometimes when I pick the first, what? What? So recently, I got an international call from a very older pastor's wife. And when I saw the number, I thought it was this person. I said, what? She said, oh, please. I said, eh, what? Say it quickly. What? Oh, please, lady, Reverend Adelaide. This is sister, this from Scotland. I said, oh, I thought it was one of these, my church members. <laughs> I'm so sorry. She said, I knew you didn't know it was me because the way you bellowed what, you know? I didn't think. Esther said, if it please the king, if it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. This wisdom must have been divine. Because I wouldn't have thought naturally that, oh, let me have dinner and then, no. Oh, you will be pressed, you will find the need so pressing. They are going to kill the Jews. The king is not doing anything about it. That's the first thing I must speak about. But no. Men do better in a relaxed environment. And sometimes when they come home, they are not relaxed. Their boss has faced them. Work has not been easy. You yourself, you are also not relaxed. You've also gone to work with all its problems. And then when they come, you are bringing all the problems in the world. The tap is broken. The father, you said you will fix it. Oh, that is true, but the timing is wrong. Don't talk about that. Just minister to his needs. Esther said, if it please, like if it seem good to you, just come to dinner with him. As for the half of the kingdom you give me and all that, I'm not interested in talking about that now. Just come to the dinner. Because a man's heart, it can be worn by food. Most of the time. <laughs> then the king called him and come quickly, Esther is inviting us. So, And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to half of the kingdom, it shall be performed. And then Esther said, My petition and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. Are you a patient person? 
can you have one banquet and not talk about your needs? And have another banquet and not talk about your needs? And just be observing protocol and having banquets for the king and your enemy? Haman? Some of you, as soon as you see him, I say, hmm. Today he will see. You, you won't even be able to function properly. But the ability to remain calm in the midst of a storm helps you to make wise decisions. Amen. I've come across many couples. Hey, Reverend, I'm leaving. I'm packing. I said, the way, the state you are in, the way you are hurt, the way you are bitter, the way you feel, this is not the time to make such an important decision. Allow the fires to die. Allow your time, yourself time to think through. Allow time to see God's face before you make such a drastic decision. Because when you make emotional decisions like Esau last night, you are hungry, you are this, the way you feel, you are likely to make wrong decisions. You know, in Ghana, we have this daily, um, weekly radio broadcast that I do. It's called Honey on My Lips. 9 to 10 every Saturday morning. And once in a while, I am able to go into the studio live, but it's very rare because I'm so busy. But when I have, one of the things that has always touched me and has often been repeated is the case, is that people phone in and they say, Lady Reverend, I was just leaving my marriage. Some of them tell me my suitcase was at the door. It was finished. By just hearing God's word, I have come back. Just hearing God's word, it has given me another perspective. And one lady, she even came to the minister's wife's conference, you know? And they kept saying, she's very busy because I was busy. And that conference is from morning to night. Lady Pastor BM is not kind. Morning to night, morning to night for days. So even the break to eat, even at a point it affected my health because the break to eat. When I, I'm on break, the little break that I'm walking to my office, the people who have come, and also want to see you. In spite of all that we've preached. <laughs> they still want to see you. And if they are light as well, I can say, oh, later, reschedule. And they'll say, mom, you always say reschedule, but you miss And so what? Go. But these are not from the church. And some of them, they look like their situations are pressing. It's, it's terrible. You know, so this lady, every break time, if it's to drink water, she'll come. And then at a point she was standing there, Mommy, I really, I must speak to you, whatever. So she sat down and I said, okay, so where do you know me from? I know you strictly from honey on my lips. And I want to tell you, I've been married for eight years. But I was out of the door Saturday morning. Then I heard, oh, honey on my lips. So I ran to come and listen. And that sent my bags in just because I heard the word of God. And now, I need help. What should I do? Bizarre situation. Married to a pastor. Bizarre. Bizarre. And then after that, we had a break and formed groups so people could speak. Oh, we had ministers, wives, minister, women desiring ministry, different groups. And even as I was preaching, some of the ladies who had come were at the back, the pastor's wives. And when I say, some of you, you are disappointed because you thought that marrying a pastor meant marrying a perfect person. Go and see how foolish she is in the house. They were preaching back. <laughs> I couldn't hear, but people told me, hey, it wasn't easy at the back. People were responding and they were, you know, but they could be entreated. The Bible says the wisdom from above is easy to be entreated. One lady came to see me. She said, somebody told me to go and see a prophet because of all that I was going through. And a pastor's wife's position is one of the loneliest. Because who do you speak to? When you speak to the people, they don't understand. You say, hey, she's saying bad things about a pastor. That's not what she's saying. She's just saying what she's going through. So who should she speak to? Nobody is there to speak to what that will not cost her something. You know, so I know that it's a very, very, very lonely place. So when you get somebody to talk to. So she said somebody called her from outside the country where she was in and said, there's this prophet here. You could go and see the prophet. So she went. The prophet said, well, I see that when you stay in your marriage, you shrivel. 
When you leave it, you blossom. That's all I can see. So this lady came to see me. Did you ever? He says that when I stay in the marriage, I shrivel. And it's true, I'm shriveling. When I leave it, I blossom. I said, really? And I said, I think there are two different people. On one occasion, the person was a prophetess. So I said, so this prophetess, who told you this? Is she married? Oh, she gave me a testimony of her life that she was married, but the man was hindering her ministry, so she has left him long ago. <laughs> she now has her six children and she's raising them. I said, did you ask her what the Bible says? I asked her, it's not what I say, it's not my mind. What does the Bible say? And she said, I know that the Bible says that we should try not to break our marriage. It doesn't say try. It says what God has put together, let no man put us under. I know all the problems you are talking about, but I believe that there's a way that you can go about them without breaking your marriage. And even, you haven't left yet. You are telling me the state of your children. It's not the best. So she asked the woman, what about what the Bible says? I said, when you go on your next consultation, ask her. Nah, I'm not talking about what the Bible says. I'm just telling you what I've seen. But what you've seen should be based on God's word. God will not go against his word. So what are are you saying? You know? So she said, I'm really tempted to take this woman's option. And I said, okay, I'll leave the decision to you. But pray about it. Give it time. Meditate on it. And see if that's what God is saying. Hey, now that's why she calls me. (laughs) Talking to her husband. They are hitting each other. I said, hey, Happiness has come. Because certain things happened. You know, I said that. He's always threatening you. I'll leave you. I'll do this. I'll do that. Don't talk about it, but now face your fears. If he leaves me, fine, I'll go. Because you're always afraid. He'll leave me. He'll this. He'll that. It makes you so uncertain. So face your fears. That I am not saying I'm going, but when they leave me and have plans, what will you do? <laughs> if you are left to the middle, I said sometimes not even divorce, but death. What will you do? You need to have a plan as a woman. I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do that. But you don't have any plan, you are there. You have never worked. How? And today, they, 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 they turn the latch off. Tomorrow, they... Why? So she started to do something about it. And as soon as she did that, the man also started to because, hey, what's happening? When I threatened her, she's normal. You even went to say she's losing her love for me. I'm saying that to say that. Esther was not in a hurry during the banquet to do anything. And most of us, we don't take our time. And I've also counseled women who cry. I want my husband back. I said, I told you, don't leave him. Because as you are changing to go next door, the grass is not greener. One lady told me I should have kept the first one. Hey, lady, wherever the second one, he's worse. I said, I prophesied it to you already. <laughs> I prophesied it to you already. But if it were us, that we feel that we have fasted and prayed. The Jews are about to be annihilated. We need to save them. We can't coolly sit at a party and be sipping. Are you all right? What's the next course? What should I bring? Hey, no. But the Bible says, in quietness and in confidence shall your strength be. Do you have the ability to be quiet before God? The Bible says, God is our refuge and our strength, the very present help in time of trouble. Though the mountains be removed and be cast into the sea. What does it say? Verse 10, be still. Hey, how are you still when the mountain is removing? And being cast into the sea, it takes a divine grace. And I think that Esther had that grace and that poise. If you are going to negotiate anything, you need to have your wits around you. You can't afford to be too emotional. And some of us too hysterical. Look, when you are angry, don't talk. Because you break relationships and the things you say, you can't take back. And when you say, I didn't mean it, the person says, you said it and you meant it with all your heart. I regret marrying you. I will never decision. Uh, you will never. Nah, 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 nah. And then after that, you sit there, you cry. I'm so sorry. So you are not sorry. You said it with so much meaning, and it's gone. It's gone. But Esther was not in a hurry. He that believeth shall not make haste. Sometimes we are in too much of a hurry even to marry. 
Only problems. Enjoy your life as a single person. Marriage is good, but you have to be ready for it. I told you, one lady told me, ah, why didn't you tell me there was such nonsense in marriage? You should have told me. I said, I'll remember. We'll put it in the marriage manual. We've said it in many ways, but we'll put it in the Many people tell me when they sit in the marriage class, they don't hear the teachings. They are in love. Cloud nine, you are not sober enough to hear what God is saying. It is when you marry, then they, will, they are now rummaging through their things to look for their marriage manual. Hey, chapter this. So it was there. Never say never, always. Eee, I've never seen it. I say to some people, join the marriage school, Lady Reverend, our love is made in heaven. We don't need marriage school. Even just a few weeks, somebody told me that. And the mother was backing her. Because, well, the mother is not in the church, so she also doesn't know this. Ah, six months, Lady Reverend, it's too long. You counsel the people for six months. I said, because of what we've seen in the body of Christ, we feel that you need to go through so that you will know. The mother was saying, that, oh, no, no, no. At our end, it's only, is it three weeks? It's only three weeks. So what I said, go through the marriage manual. You will see what they learn. Temperaments, communication, parenting, honeymoon, blood, things, sickle cell, how to keep yourself pure, uh, 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 different topics, responsibilities, duties of the husband, duties of the wife, so many things. You need it. No. You are not sober enough. You are too in love. You are running. And sometimes you see the signs, but you don't want to see. And you call it other things. You see, when God is showing you, you say it's the devil. You bind him. You don't have to bind him. <laughs> Esther could be still in the midst of such turbulence. And you and I must learn to quieten our souls like a weaned child before God. She was not paranoid, and she was not overtaken by her emotions. She sought to create a conducive environment. She brought up the matter after the banquet. She brought up the matter. You see, when Haman was going after the first banquet, he thought that he had been favored. You know, and then he went to make this trap for Mordecai and all that. But that's not what we are talking about. Now we want to go to chapter 7. The king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther. And the king said unto Esther on the second day, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? It shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther said, if I found favor in thy sight, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. She said, I'm not thinking of myself more highly than I ought to. If you were just treating them as slaves, I will not say anything. But the fact that they are going to be spoiled, they are going to be destroyed, and they are going to be killed, that is what has brought me to a place like this. What she's saying is, I'm not presumptuous. I don't take things for granted that because I'm queen, I can ask for anything. But I'm just saying that if even they could live and they were slaves, I will not even ask you for, for this. And also, I'm asking for my life. She added herself to the problem like Abigail. That thing makes a breakthrough. Abigail said, my trespass, forgive me my trespass. Esther said, my life and that of my people. Amen. Amen. Then, the king said, who is he and where is he that dares presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Esther showed kindness to Haman and did not behave as if she had 
any bone to pick with him. So the king thought that all was well. So after the second banquet, when she said, is this wicked Haman? I believe that the king thought, the king is, the queen is so kind to you. How can you have such an idea? She has even selected you as a favorite of all the people in the court. You should come. Is that how you repay the, king, the queen's kindness? Hey man, you are in trouble. The power of seeming love or love. The Bible says in Matthew 5, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them that despitefully use you. There are four classes of people. Your enemies. Some people say, me, I don't have any enemy, whatever. Then this verse doesn't apply to you. Because you have to look for the enemy before you can love him. God knows that you have enemies. Either you don't like them or they don't like you. They are enemies anyway. <laughs> so love your enemies. So to the enemy, what you owe is love. Then those who hate you, do good. Haman hated the Jews. So me, I'll invite you to the banquet. You come. Do good to them that hate you. And then the people who curse you, bless them. Bless them. Pronounce a blessing. The Bible says when you do that, you are heaping coals of fire. And then the fourth one, those who just use you. Despitefully, they just use you. Use you. He said, pray for them. They are despitefully use you. So when the king asked, who is doing this? He said, oh, is this adversary him and this wicked man? What? Look at the queen's kindness to you. And then how you are behaving. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther. Before then, he had not bothered to speak to Esther about anything. He was just going to wipe out the Jews. But now, he saw that the scales had tilted. And Esther was becoming powerful. Humility, patience, strength, quietness makes you a strong person. It's not shouting and looking that, that makes you powerful. In quietness and in confidence shall your strength be. Amen. Amen. So Haman is now begging. And he's requesting for his life. What he was taking from somebody, now he's requesting for. Then the king returned. Verse 8, then the king said, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the queen's king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And then somebody said, oh, Haman even has the gallows. So they hanged Haman on the gallows. Amen. Amen. That's Esther. Esther 8, verse 2. On that day, the king gave the house of Haman, the Jew's enemy, unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from him, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Look, you may be the, the woman, but you are still powerful. And that power you don't take by force. But with your service and your heart, it just makes room for you. And you can be entrusted with power because you will not become a Jezebel. So the king gave him everything and then Esther said, really? Haman's place was a place of great influence. Such that he was even going to kill the Jews. Let me put Mordecai there. So that he will oversee the affairs of the Jews. After your negotiation, you come into power. God brings you into that place. And Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet. Remember Abigail? Falling down at David's feet bowing and calling him Lord and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of him and the Agagites and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then again, the king held out the golden scepter towards Esther. So Esther arose and stood, even in the midst of her emotions, crying, she's still observing protocol. She arose and stood before the king. All along, she has not shown emotions. Now, she allowed herself to be vulnerable. I don't think that she was using tears like Delilah. 
Delilah, she wanted to kill Samson, but she would be crying, you don't love me. If you love me, you will not. That's a whole message. Types of relationships, which you should get. The Delilah and Samson relationship is a toxic relationship, and I speak about it and the types of relationship. But this one, she's genuinely, I believe, bringing out pent-up feelings. So she's crying and saying, it's been so difficult. It's been so tough. So please, the device. You see, I would have thought that that device can be there because things have changed. But Esther wants to finish the job and finish it properly. So that the things that, the device that was made to kill the Jews, I want it taken away and destroyed. I don't want it to even be there for one day, somebody to think of it again. I want to erase everything about it. And she stood and said again, if it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and this thing seems right before the king, She's still not being presumptuous. She's still saying, your views are necessary. What you think is important. What do you think? Learn to ask your husband, what do you think? But some of you have plans. I'm going here, I'm buying this, I'm doing this, and I'm doing it. So let it be known. But ask him what he thinks, if it please the king. Some of you, you plan your holidays, your husband doesn't even know. My husband told Bishop, and I said, my wife, she always plans holidays on her own. She doesn't have us in mind. Hmm. And if it please the king, and if I found favor in his sight, and the theme seemed right, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by him and the son, which he wrote to destroy the Jews. How can I endure to see the evil? Then verse 7, the king said unto Esther the king, the queen and to Mordecai, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you now. Mordecai has been put in Haman's place. And just like Haman wrote against the Jews, now he's writing for the Jews. Why? Because Esther had the mind to set him in that place. And then they write that The Jews should be set free. All the things that they have said should not come to pass. Verse 15. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with a great crown of gold and with a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, with us, wherever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Ada, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment, the Jews gathered themselves and all that. What I'm looking for is, Verse 12, and the king said unto Esther, the queen, the Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan the palace and 10 sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is thy petition and it shall be granted thee? Or what is thy request further and it shall be done? Now things that you haven't even asked for. You are being asked because of your wisdom in negotiation, dealing with people. Your wisdom. Now you are being asked extra things that you have not even asked for. Verse 30, then Esther said, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according unto thee, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged. Can you imagine? This cool Esther, she's executing from place to place. Now she's saying that ten people should be killed. How did it all begin? Favor. And negotiation. And they hanged Haman's ten sons. Hmm. Mercy. Verse 25 of chapter 9. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Wherefore they call these days Purim, after the name of Pew. Therefore, for all the words of this letter and of that which they had seen concerning this matter and which had come unto them, the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such, they should keep in writing for two days. Oh, 
I wanted to read where it said that the Jews celebrate the Feast of Esther up to today. It's just because of negotiation skills. Hallelujah. At a certain point, you are not asking for a favor, but you are being done the favor. I pray that we will come to the place where we believe that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds which you never thought that you would be able to. May we use spiritual and divine weapons. That's also another sermon altogether. My, what's the title of those sermons, Danny? The weapons. That they are strong. And I pray that God will help you in your walk with him. To have that kind of wisdom. That kind of favor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.